All right, got this cool little animation. I'll get it started with this. All right. Hi. Uh, so this is what Drift. I'm going to be doing another one of my practice question um, fun videos where pretty much the point of this is to get some good practice in doing like, you know, kind of seeing, okay, here I've read about this, I've learned about this in class, but now how am I going to bring it together in order to see, um, you know, kind of how, uh, you know, how I can prepare for the exam. Because half of uh, preparing for an exam is making sure that you have immersed yourself in the content. And the other half is making sure that you also understand test taking strategy and understand um, how to approach nursing school exams, which can be super tricky. Um, so this particular one is for those in the med surge class that um, are in their beautiful section over cardiovascular, my favorite, you know. Um, and this specifically is EKG practice questions, because this is an area that a lot of people are like, oh, how do I go about this? Or what kind of questions could you ask? So I think it just kind of helps to know where to start. And don't you just love that I found this moving EKG? Ah, oh, so beautiful. All righty. Let's get moving forward. Let's look at the first question. So it says a nurse is caring for a client in the following rhythm. What treatment is most appropriate for this rhythm? So just a side note here, you know, in this class, we're not going to expect you to know the drugs um, in depth uh, it, for this class, like, you know, where we're going to be giving you have to choose, is it this med or this med? Um, you know, doctors decide what medications to give. It is good to know the basic treatments um, when it comes to rhythms. But what I would recommend doing as you're studying is as you're looking at each rhythm, try to think about what the overall goal is. Is Am I, am I trying to speed it up? Am I trying to slow it down? Am I trying to convert it back to normal, et cetera? Um, that can kind of help get you started. Um, so these aren't talking about medications, these are talking about other treatments which you can be responsible for knowing some of um, knowing uh, what each of these is and um, what rhythm that they treat. So in a question like this, first we want to make sure that we understand what it's asking us and it's saying what treatment is most appropriate. So that's kind of giving me a hint that maybe some of these other treatments may be appropriate too, but what is the biggest or most appropriate one? Um, and so the one that's going to be like, when you think of that, think of what's most directly going to be helpful um, or what's going to be most effective. So uh, a question like this has two parts. First, I have to interpret the rhythm. Then I also have to figure out, okay, if this is this rhythm, then what do I do about it? So I like to use my systematic method for ECG questions. So what I do is I always start first um, by counting my rate. So I have a rate here of 30 because there is three of the pointy things. Here, let me go here. Three of the pointy things. And then um, I times that by 10. So I have a rate of 30. Then I look, is it regular? It looks like it's regular. And then I look to see if there's all the parts. Is there a P wave? Yes. Is it upright? You know, is there one for every QRS? Yes. And it looks normal. Okay. Uh, skinny QRS. Okay, that's I got three skinny QRSs that that look good. I got a T wave after every QRS. So it's like I have all my parts. It's regular. The only thing is it's a little slow. So that rhythm is going to be sinus bradycardia. So it's really saying what's most appropriate for sinus bradycardia. So first choice A, prepare to defibrillate the client. Now, a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, some people may wanna choose this because they're like, hey, that's super low. Their heart's about to stop. But we only defibrillate people that have um, no pulse, but electrical activity. So um, there's nowhere in the question where it tells me that they have no pulse. So there's, uh, this is not something that's appropriate for defibrillation. This is not also a defibrillator, a, a rhythm that we can defibrillate. I can talk. Um, so uh, the second one, prepare to start compressions. Now, some people might also choose this, like, hey, I'm going to be ready. But the person's heart's not stopped. It's just slow. So um, there's no indication right now that they need compressions. Um, C is set up for transcutaneous pacing. Well, I like that one because I think if I remember correctly, pacing helps to increase the rate of the heart. And that seems like that's my goal for bradycardia is to speed it up. But let's look at my other choice. And D, teach client to perform vagal maneuver. So if I remember correctly, the vagal maneuver, that's where you kind of like bear down like you're having a bowel movement, but I believe that slows your heart rate down. It doesn't speed it up. So um, if it's not appropriate to do A or B, because A and B, like another test taking strategy here is that they're both kind of saying the same thing, like, hey, this is an emergency. We need to start like 
um, life support measures, et cetera. And so, um, you know, both of those, it's not appropriate for this rhythm. And then D is going to do the opposite of what I want to do. So the only one that actually helps go in the direction that I want to go in to increase the heart rate is going to be C. And C is the correct answer. All righty. So let's go into the next one. So that's one type of question we can give you. We can also give you a strip like this and then say, what is the priority action? So this is a nurse is caring for the client in this rhythm. What is the priority action? So this is, um, again, asking you when it says priority action, these might all be treatments for this rhythm or things we need to do, uh, but what is going to be most effective, most helpful, or most direct in treating this rhythm? So first, let's identify our rhythm. So we've got a fast, weird rhythm. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So I've got a rate of 200. Um, I, it's pretty regular ish, but like, I mean, the pointy things have this, about the same distance between them there. I don't see any P waves. Um, I see a wide QRS and there's a T wave there, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to discern everything, but I've got a fast fat rhythm. So I'm looking at something ventricular and it's pretty regular. So comparing VTAC and VFib, this is probably going to be VTAC because um, it's got that V formation where I can actually count the Vs, whereas in VFib, I usually can't count the, um, the rate. So I think I've got ventricular tachycardia here. So it's saying, what's the priority for ventricular tachycardia? So my first choice is start compressions on the client. Well, that sounds like something I want to do. And then B is defibrillate as soon as possible. Here we go again. Um, so then I remember that we do want to defibrillate as soon as possible for this rhythm, but I, let me check my other answers and see what else is going on. So um, this, like, compared to the last one, this is a lethal rhythm. So I'm leaning towards something like compressions and defibrillate. Um, C is prepare for transcutaneous pacing. Okay. But that's going to speed it up. I don't want to speed it up. So I'm going to cross out C and then D is check if the client has a pulse. Hmm. So I'm between A, B, and D. So let's say that I like, I've got a bunch of choices and I'm just not really sure. Well, then I've got to remember um, what we do in these rhythms. Well, first and foremost, um, we do want to defibrillate as soon as possible. Uh, you know, uh, not defibrillate, but we want to do something as soon as possible. But, um, you know, I'm not sure in this rhythm exactly what's going on. All I have is that they're in this rhythm. I need more information. So in other words, if I'm looking at the difference between A, B, and D, um, like I, in order to start compressions on the client, they have to have no pulse. And there's nowhere in the question that says they have no pulse. And same defibrillate as soon as possible. I might need to do that, but that's only if they have no pulse. And I don't know if they have a pulse or not because it doesn't say it in the question. So, um, cause this is the thing, if this was V fib and, um, we were trying to look at what we were going to do for this patient for V fib, we do want to defibrillate as soon as possible. And we, you know, we do want to start compressions immediately, et cetera. Um, because with V fib, there is never a pulse. Like there's no V fib with a pulse, but here's the thing about VTAC. If you remember from class is that VTAC can have a pulse or no pulse. So you always have to look at, to see, um, you know, with the rhythm that like, if I, if I have a rhythm that can have pulse or no pulse, what's my first action going to be? It needs to be to check if they have a pulse. Cause the only way I'm going to know what to do is the rhythm, um, the treatments are different. So for VTAC with a pulse, um, let's say I check a pulse and they do have a pulse with this rhythm. Um, then I'm going to look at doing drugs and cardioversion. If it's VTAC without a pulse, then I'm going to start compressions and defibrillate as soon as possible. Um, and so kind of, again, to A and B are similar in some of their actions. And so there are some rhythms where we need to discern which one we're going to do first. I know everyone's always so worried about this, that we're going to give you a choice like, hey, do you shock them first or do you start compressions first? Um, and, and know this for, um, for emergency rhythms is, is that when it comes to it, like, let's say I had a patient in V-fib and V-fib, you know, we want to defib as soon as possible. And that's what our students really focus on. It's very true. But here's the thing is, is that in order to fibrillate a client, I have to attach pads, get the crash cart. And so I'm not going to delay chest compressions in order to defibrillate a client. Um, and so, um, in other words, I want to defibrillate as soon as possible. That is my, um, that is the treatment that's going to be very helpful and effective, but I'm not going to wait 
to defibrillate them, like a way to start compressions in order to defibrillate them. Like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, their heart stopped. Hey, grab the crash cart. Let's go ahead and wait till he comes in here and then we'll get them attached and then we'll shock them. No, I'm going to start compressions on that client. Um, and so if this was VTAC without a pulse that said that we had more information here, um, the priority answer would probably be to start compressions on the client because we want to, um, to do that in order to continue circulation until we can attach them to pads. Now, if you ever had a question that said, hey, pads are attached to patients, what is your priority action? Then it would be to defibrillate. If the pads are already attached and we're ready, because that's pretty much what we do, pretty much um, what happens in the hospital. Like I said, let's say I had a patient in V-fib or VTAC without a pulse, I'm going to start compressions. And then as soon as their pads are attached, I'm going to shock them right then and there. Like, so normally with like, it used to be with VFib, we would wait two minutes or do like one round of CPR um, before we would shock them. But now we do not wait. As soon as those pads are attached, we defibrillate them. So in other words, if we see like chaotic electrical activity, the best thing we can do is shock them as soon as possible to get them back to a normal rhythm um, versus just do compressions um, and ventilate them. So I hope that wasn't too confusing, but just to kind of sum up, um, when a patient has ventricular tachycardia, they can have, which is this rhythm, they can have a pulse or no pulse. So my priority action is going to be to check if they have a pulse because I don't know what to do next until I know if they have a pulse. Because if they have a pulse, I can cardiovert them. If they don't have a pulse, I can defibrillate them. Those are two very different things. And I would know the difference between those two. Um, so the other answers are not appropriate because C, uh, we'll speed things up and we don't want things any faster. It's already at 200. And um, A and B may be things that I do, but they're not going to be the first thing because I don't know if the client has a pulse or not yet. Oh, and just as a heads up, like we, we're usually not mean where we're going to give you one where it's going to ask you to start compressions or um, defibrillate first because uh, it's just a hard thing. And again, it's one of those things that it's very much like depends on what's set up and stuff in the room. So don't get too freaked out if you were confused by everything I just said. So anyway, question three, a nurse is assessing a client on a cardiac unit. On assessment of their cardiac monitor, the nurse finds a fast irregular rhythm um, with normal QRS complexes, but non-discernible P waves. What is the priority action? So this is another way we can ask a question. We can describe a rhythm. So we're not giving you a strip, but we're giving you a description of the rhythm. You have to figure out what that rhythm is. And then it's also asking you what's the priority action. Um, we also could just describe the rhythm and ask you what it is. So um, it is a fast, irregular rhythm. So I know it's not something sinus, um, normal QRS complexes. So I know it has to be something atrial um, and non-discernible P waves. So anytime you see non, the word non-discernible means I can't find them. I can't see them well. Um, they're not easy to spot. So non-discernible um, would be the same if, if it said like fibulatory, et cetera. So what are we talking about here? Well, the only two um, atrial rhythms that I need to know are AFib or A flutter, and then also um, supraventricular tachycardia. And the important difference there is, is that supraventricular tachycardia is regular, skinny and regular, skinny, fast and regular, I should say. And so um, the only one that's irregular is going to be atrial fib or atrial flutter. So that's what I'm dealing with here. It's, it's pretty much asking what's the priority for someone who's in a A fib or a flutter that's fast. So uh, choice A is grab the crash cart. Well, you know, um, you know, it's Cardioversion is a treatment for this, but um, when it says grab the crash cart, that's usually saying like, hey, there's no pulse, like you need to do something immediately. And there's no sign that there's no pulse in this patient or that they're um, about to crash. So, you know, we're at, not necessarily at this time need to grab the crash cart. Check the client's vital signs. Well, I like that because, you know, with any rhythm, we definitely want to check their stability. Like, how are they doing? Are they stable or not? I'll go, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but I like that one so far. C, apply 100% oxygen to the client. Now, this is one that a lot of students would like because they're like, hey, ABCs. Um, but in order to like, you know, to really know how to best help the client, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, first, I need to possibly assess them. So usually we assess first um, to see if they're stable or not before we take action. 
And then D says draw troponin level. So um, that helps to tell if a patient's having a heart attack. And I don't know, this could be related to it, but I wouldn't think that's a priority action. I'll tell you as a whole, drawing labs is very rarely a priority action because um, usually it takes time and there's other things we can do before. Usually we want to see, do we want to assess or treat first? Um, and um, usually we're going to start, uh, you know, if the patient is, uh, if we're able to, if the patient like has a pulse, et cetera, um, then usually we start by assessing first. So when I'm going between B and C, um, you know, applying 100% oxygen, it seems like it would be better to do B, which is check the client's vital signs first to kind of see where they're at. And it's not necessarily to see like, oh, okay, they don't really need the oxygen. Well, they could be actually perfectly fine. Um, but applying 100% oxygen, that's a lot of oxygen, um, especially if the client may be okay. Uh, I don't know how fast the rhythm is. I don't know. Um, and the, uh, when, I, when we look at vital signs in a client that has an irregular rhythm, the things that we want to look at is we want to look at what their blood pressure is, like how, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, if it, it, cause we would expect it in a lot of dysrhythmias, it drops. Uh, and then we also want to see what their oxygenation is. So we're looking at perfusion through their blood pressure and oxygenation through their SpO2. And so these are especially key when we're talking about atrial fibrillation because in atrial fibrillation, um, remember they lose that atrial kick or that extra push of blood to the, from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart. And then they also um, have pooling of blood in the atria because the fibrillatory activity so they can have hypotension and decreased perfusion. So I think the priority action here is going to be to assess and see how the patient's doing with this rhythm um, so we can have the necessary information to call the physician so they can um, give appropriate orders. So we will start with B, check the client's vital signs. All right, a nurse is evaluating a client's electrocardiogram rhythm or ECG and finds them to be in the following rhythm. The nurse understands them to be in what rhythm? So this is just a simple knowledge one. What rhythm is this? So um, let's go ahead and go through, like, since the only thing I need to do is discern what this rhythm is, let's go ahead and do it. So let's count. So let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So another rate of 200. Um, <clears throat> then it's regular. Um, I don't, I kind of see like a little notch here where there might be a P wave, but it's hard to tell, but it's super fast. So sometimes you can't see the P waves because it's super fast. I've got a skinny QRS, which means I have a top of the heart problem or an atrial rhythm. Um, and there's a T wave there. It's just kind of mixed with the P wave. So, um, so I've got a regular skinny fast rhythm. And what do we say that rhythm would be? So it's regular, so it can't be a fib or a flutter. Um, and then it is, uh, oh, and I guess I could look at my options. I forgot this question was about this. Let's, let's go through this. Let's get, let's do it this way instead of, um, doing it the other way. Just look at the rhythm. So let's look at a sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, the thing that discerns sinus tachycardia from other types of tachycardia is going to be that there is a P wave QRS and T wave um, that's easily discernible or I can easily see it. Like I can see that P wave and know that it's sinus. With this one, I really can't do that. And sinus tachycardia also only goes up to a rate of around 150. I think your book says like, you know, maybe 180, but really there, there's no sinus tachycardia after 150. Very rarely are you gonna see that. Um, so uh, sinus um, tachycardia is out because this is a rate of 200, so it's a little too fast. Ventricular tachycardia. Well, I already said that this is not a ventricular rhythm um, because my QRS is skinny. So if my QRS is skinny, it has to be a problem with the top of the heart or the atria. So that's out. Then atrial flutter. Well, this can't be flutter because it's not regular. Uh, sorry, yes, because it is regular. So because this is regular and fast and um, I could kind of see a little bit of a P wave, this cannot be atrial flutter. Um, and then the last choice is supraventricular tachycardia. Now that sounds good because it's skinny, fast, and regular. And that is really what defines supraventricular tachycardia, which remember is that um, rhythm. It usually starts around a rate of 150 and can go up very high. And um, it's um, when the top of the heart, uh, what do you call it, um, it, it is 
I don't want to say irritable, but uh, the top of the heart is uh, sending out too, too many beats. So that's why they say supra means above. And um, what's above the ventricles is the atria. So this is also known as atrial tachycardia. Um, like sometimes they're kind of classed together where the top of the heart is pumping or sending too many signals, um, creating a tachycardia. So this is that one I told you that a lot of nursing students can go into because they drink too many caffeinated beverages and they're super stressed. So the correct answer here is going to be D, supraventricular tachycardia. All right, question five. A nurse is caring for a client in atrial fibrillation who is going to undergo an elective cardioversion. Ah, so this is a treatment question. What should the nurse include in the teaching regarding this procedure? So this is asking me, um, what teaching is important. Um, so like if someone's going to undergo this, this is really asking about my knowledge of if I know what an electrical, uh, elective cardioversion is. Um, so, and I mean, knowing what rhythm they're in, that might be important information, but it really seems like that based on the answer choices, this is just going to ask me, what does a cardioversion do? So this is more of a knowledge question. So let's go through these. The goal of this procedure is to return the client to a normal sinus rhythm. Now that sounds pretty good to me. Like, I mean, I, I know that the goal for atrial fibrillation and for, you know, cardioversion is like conversion. I want to convert them back to normal. So I like that so far, but let me check my other choices because with a question like this, um, and it's not worded this way, but you might see a question like that, ask you like, Hey, I'm teaching a client about this, which of, uh, which of the following statements is most, um, how would we maybe word it most like we might say that what is um and i'm eventually going to get it i'm sorry my brain's slow today what is going to be not most consistent but most accurate that's it yeah so what's going to be the most accurate description of this procedure so in a question like that we could give you a bunch of things of uh, pretty much when we give you a question like that what we're asking you is we're trying to figure out if you know one what the procedure is, and two, how to talk to family about it. So sometimes, like this is not this question, but we can, um, you know, I've seen, you know, trickier questions where it'll ask you, um, <clears throat> you know, how to describe the procedure to like a family member or the patient. And you always want to think about if we're talking about, this is not this question, by the way, I'm just talking in general. When we're, when we're describing procedures or disease processes to a family member or patient, we always want to keep it simple and keep it at a, um, a level that they can understand. Um, so sometimes there'll be a right answer uh, that is like correctly describing it, but it's a really technical term. So usually we want to, you know, keep it more simple in questions like that. Um, but keep in mind for questions like that, sometimes multiple answers are correct, but it's like, what's the best way to um, describe this or talk about this with the patient. This is really talking about teaching um, and um, what like pretty much we're trying to figure out what the goal is. And so um, only one of these is going to be right. So this is a different type of question. So only one of these is going to be right. So I'm looking for which one is right. Now, I really like A and it sounds right to me, but I'm still going to go and look because you need to check all the answers. And this is really important in test taking strategy. Sometimes you get married to one answer and you just move on before reading all the answers. Always read all the answer choices. Make sure that you're not um, skipping over something. Anyway. So I like A, but let's go to B. The goal of this procedure is to increase the heart rate back to normal. So cardioversion that converts or slows down, it cannot speed up. That's a pacemaker is the only thing that can speed that up. All right, then C, the goal of this procedure is to stabilize electrical activities in the ventricles. Hmm. So I like stabilize electrical activity, but is in the ventricles? I'm in atrial fibrillation. So this is the key here is that you might read this one and be like, oh, I like that. But you have to read the whole answer. Remember, the whole answer always has to be correct for this to be a good answer choice. Um, then D, the goal of this procedure is to defibrillate the client and restore circulation. So there is cardioversion and then there's defibrillation. Um, this is cardioversion. So these are two separate things. So we are not defibrillating. Defibrillating is higher energy and it's for people that do not have a pulse. Whereas cardioversion is for someone who has a pulse but crazy electrical activity that needs to be calmed down. So the best answer here and the only one that's actually correct is going to be A, to convert the client back to a normal rhythm. Number six, a nurse interprets the, their client's ECG rhythm to be sinus tachycardia, which of the following clients is most at risk to be in this rhythm. So a question like this is looking for risk, when you're looking at risk factors, is looking for who has the most risk factors. So for this, I want you to, and I know that you don't have, um, 
you know, where you can write on the screen in um, when it comes to uh, your test and stuff like that, that you're not able to actually write or do on this, but you should have scrap paper. So you can totally write on the scrap paper. So um, what I would recommend you do is for each Android choice, tally up how many risk factors they have. Um, so um, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, I have to think about like what, who's gonna be at risk for sinus tachycardia, what's gonna cause your heart rate to go up. So um, the first one says a client with hypothermia. So I have to think is hypothermia a risk factor. Now y'all haven't learned about hypothermia yet, but um, anytime the, uh, I do know that when someone has a fever, their heart rate increases. So I think if they're cold, maybe it would decrease. So I'm going to say that's not a risk factor and smoke cigarettes. Uh, possibly, I know some drugs and alcohol can increase it. I'm not sure if cigarettes do, but just to be safe, I'm going to give them one risk factor say that maybe you know smoking might increase their uh, risk for sinus tachycardia so then i go to the second one a client with a fever who is dehydrated and has low blood pressure hmm. so i know fever is a risk factor um uh, dehydration is a risk factor and having low blood pressure can cause your heart rate to go up so that's three risk factors so far they have the most so this is kind of what i do i go through each one so a client with chronic headaches pain can cause uh sinus tachycardia who takes calcium channel blockers well calcium channel blockers if you remember because i know you love all the meds in this section they actually decrease your heart rate so that's only going to be one risk factor there then a client with diabetes um, diabetes in itself doesn't cause uh, sinus tachycardia. It does cause a lot of cardiovascular problems. Um, but I know if your blood sugar is too high or too low, it can um, uh, lead to, uh, to tachycardia. Um, has a blood sugar of 139. Well, I mean, that's not normal, but that's not high enough to cause dehydration or low enough to cause a problem. So um, really this patient has no risk factors. So out of all of them, the patient with the most risk factors is going to be B, a client with a fever, dehydrated, low blood pressure. So um, this is real. When we ask risk factor questions, we're trying to see if you know your risk factors. And we're also trying to see if you can um, risk stratify. And sometimes what I mean by that is, is that like really see who's most at risk. Now, there's times that we're going to have a question like this where um, someone might have like a risk factor that really stands out. Like maybe like we have, let's say that we had one that's like, hey, a client who is, um, who has a fever. And then maybe like, then we had another one, a client who is dehydrated, has low blood pressure and is in pain. Um, so it's going to be hard because sometimes like your head, maybe in class, you heard your professor say like, hey, um, this is a big risk factor for this. And sometimes um, students will choose an answer choice that has a risk factor that they're like, oh, this is a big risk factor versus counting them. You always need to count them. It's whoever has the most risk factors. It's not about who has the biggest risk factor, who has the most. You have to count them. So that's what's important. It's just kind of do a systematic, go through each one, count how many risk factors they have and go from there. All right, last question. A nurse is preparing to discharge, uh, is preparing to discharge for a client with atrial fibrillation. I'm sorry, the grammar there is not very well. And apparently my grammar talking is not well either. I think I'm falling apart. It's okay, it's summer. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, my brain is only uh, firing on so many, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's, yeah, I can't even form a sentence. My brain is not firing correctly. Let's just put it that way. So a nurse is preparing to discharge a client with atrial fibrillation. Which teaching should the nurse and client? Uh, include for this client. I really maybe should quit now while I'm ahead. Um, <laughs> so at least this is the last question uh, before I make the next video and maybe I should, uh, you know, take a little nap in between. So anyway, let's see what's going on. So atrial fibrillation, I'm preparing for discharge. So um, the questions like this, we could either ask, you know, what teaching should the nurse include? Or, you know, we could ask which teaching shows that the patient understood the edge or which statement um, indicates that the client understood the education. Or we could say what statement um, shows that the, that teaching was not effective or more teaching is uh, needed, et cetera. So there's a couple of different ways we could ask this, but always make sure that you're, um, you know what the question like this, are we looking for what's correct, what's not correct, et cetera. So um, with this, we're, uh, we're just trying to see what we're gonna include. So what teaching is important for a client with atrial fibrillation? So, and it looks like it's focusing on treatments. So it says, the first one says this rhythm is harmless and requires no treatment unless the rate is greater than a hundred. So, I mean, that sounds okay. Cause I like part of that. Um, I do know that we do want to do uh, certain treatments. If the heart rate's above a hundred, we don't want it too fast because we want to keep it. Like, I know our goal is to convert it or if nothing else, slow it down. 
but I don't know that the rhythm is harmless. And remember with questions like this, that are these like longer answer choice or answer choices that are longer like this, you always wanna make sure that the whole answer is correct, not just part of it. So B says this rhythm will require treatment to increase the rate and antiplatelet therapy for life. So um, we definitely don't want to increase the rate. This is not a slow rhythm usually, it's usually a fast rhythm. Um, and so I don't think that's correct. And then I don't think they get antiplatelet therapy. Um, they get anticoagulant therapy. So uh, I don't think this is correct. So both, neither parts to me are correct. C says the rhythm, this rhythm requires immediate activation of advanced cardiovascular life support or ACLS. Well, um, this is not a lethal rhythm and we only activate ACLS when it were lethal rhythms like VTAC without a pulse or VFib um, or VTAC with a pulse, et cetera, that is kind of stuff. So I don't think that's correct. So that only leaves me with D, which is this rhythm will require to decrease the rate I like and anticoagulant therapy for life. I like. So um, both of these um, are correct. And remember, that's the key for a question like this is both of them have to be correct. And it's the only one that has um, both correct answers. And hold on one second. Let me make sure. I think my cats are starting to fight. And one day, eventually, my cats will die. And um, I maybe can have some more professional videos and maybe wear something other than sweatpants to these videos. But for now, um, hopefully this, these interruptions are not too disrupting to your learning. If they are, I'm very sorry, but such is life. So anyway, um, so I was saying D, you know, like that's the only one that has um, both answers are correct. Uh, both parts of the answer are correct. So, and it's the best answer out of all these choices. The only one that um, gives me like information that is fully like, like you always have to think about that it describes it the best way and that it's accurate. So D is the only correct one. Um, so the other test taking strategy here is that you can look at B and D are similar, like how they have one has increased the rate, one has decreased the rate, and they both have some sort of therapy at the end. Um, so sometimes this is a cue for you. A lot of times if there's two that are similar, but um, but opposite, like, you know, like they have like a similar setup, but they're opposite, like one saying increase, one saying decrease, et cetera. A lot of times one of those is going to be correct. So let's say that you didn't know if A or C were correct. Then um, sometimes you can narrow down and go to B and D and say, hey, it's probably one of these. Now, which one of these do I think is most accurate or most correct? So that's another little test taking strategy. Thanks for putting up with me and all of my horrible jokes and also interruptions and um, lack of professionalism at the same time. So I'm always grateful to be here with you. And I hope that you are loving cardiac as much as I am. I'll see you guys for the next one.